so I did a little mini introduction of myself. My name's Diljeet Singh. I'm a gynecologic oncologist, I'm currently the vice president of PNHP. And I've been, um, God, I can never remember how long I've been involved with PNHP. Um, so we're going to skip that. I currently live in Norfolk, um, and I am moving to Washington, D.C. in May. Exciting. I lived there for many years, and now I'm moving back. Um, and I'm a practicing clinician. I've been in practice for 25 years, um, and we can continue to talk. Um, so, you know, full disclosure, I usually have like a 90 minutes sort of slide, you know, time to talk. And so I have a very jam packed 70 slides usually. Um, and so I took on this challenge of like, how many slides did I really need? Now, it turns out we have a lot of members, but I'm assuming you all are here because you want to learn. And so I'm going to just, you know, can we do the whole talk in five slides? So first slide. The United States is the only developed nation that does not provide comprehensive health care. We have 25.6 million uninsured, and of course, we have a substantial number of underinsured, which means people who can't access care because of their premiums, their deductibles, um, they don't have coverage for the things that they need coverage for, or there are not hospitals, physicians, or clinics available where they are. Um, from some really interesting uh, research done um, by doctors Wool, Handler, and Himmelstein in 2017, and then data recollected, we think that about 37,000 people die a year from lack of coverage, and that in the United States, medical debt contributes to two thirds of personal bankruptcies, with 77% of those people having coverage at the time um, they got ill. We have the most expensive healthcare in the world. We spend almost twice as much on healthcare as everyone else. We have worst health outcomes on many measures and we'll cover some of those. And we don't cover everyone, of course. Third party entities who don't bring anything to the table take roughly 32 to 35 cents of every healthcare dollar in profit and bureaucratic waste. And that, of course, makes a significant amount of our health care expenses. Right now, we spend enough to cover everyone and to add mental health, dental, and vision coverage. This kind of concept that, you know, we all benefit when everyone has health care unconnected to employment is something we don't talk about a lot. But, you know, as a group of health care um, professionals, we believe and understand that the best, longest quality life in the safest, happiest society is something we'd like to achieve. And I think something we don't talk about a lot is kind of thinking about the financial and creative freedom we have as individuals when our employment is not the source of our health care coverage. And then from that other perspective, thinking about businesses, small and large, free of the burden of providing health care, have the potential to be more successful nationally and internationally if all they're focused on is their business, right? Whether it's like making cars or lip gloss or whatever. And then the other piece I don't think we talk enough about is the concept that health care is not a commodity, right? There's not a benefit to the free market. And we think the main reason for that in health economic terms is information asymmetry, right? That we don't always know what we need and when we'll need it, right? We don't know if we're gonna get a rare form of lymphoma. Um, we don't know if we're gonna need fertility care or not. And then there's no time to shop, right? If you're having chest pain, if you break an arm or leg, you don't necessarily have time to shop for healthcare. And then again, that's all just a uh, fallacy, right? Because we don't actually shop. There's um, our employer's choices, what they give us, or we live in a geographic region for many of us currently, like I just have been practicing in the Norfolk, Virginia, Chesapeake area, where like you really don't have a lot of choices. If you want to see an endocrinologist, if you want to see a urologist, your options may be limited. And then the physician challenges um, are, to me, an important part of why we need to think about fixing our system, right? There is an inherent conflict of interest when what's best for the patient may not be the best for your employer, whether that's a corporation or private equity um, or a hospital system. 
And we often talk about the progressive, I've been in practice now 25 years, and the change in the amount of autonomy we had in terms of recommendations we make to patients, the sanctity of the patient-physician relationship, um, patient trust, and you know what they believe our, do they believe that we have their best um, their best outcomes in mind when we make recommendations and how that's changed over time. The limited time we get to spend with patients between the burden of, you know, the electronic billing record and making sure we put in the family history and did our whole review of systems and all the other things which may or may not pertain to the visit of that day, you know, Again, like I said, I've been in the, doing this 25 years and I will still be like trying to chase down the right code because I ordered a blood test that's slightly different than the other things. And I waste my time figuring out what code it is. And then of course, pre-authorizations and denials. There's also been this physician wellness movement that in many ways I am extremely supportive of, but the idea that when we're frustrated, when we're worn out, when we feel like at our wits end to help people that this is burnout, where if I just meditated more, exercised more, learned a little yoga, blah, 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 that this would solve the problem as opposed to we have a problem with our whole system that we are reacting to. And so moral injury, and these are two descriptions that Wendy Dean um, and Simon Talbot make in um, there are a wide variety of, you know, they've got podcasts and books, et cetera. Um, the challenge of simultaneously knowing what patients need, but not being able to provide it due to constraints beyond our control. And then of course, with the last slide, what's the solution? Improved Medicare, the concept that we provide all medically necessary care, inpatient, outpatient, medical, vision, that we don't have co-pays, deductibles, or premiums because we know all cost sharing just prevents people from getting the care that they need, that they don't need supplemental or gap plans, that's equitably funded, and a sim we have a simplified payment design. All right, so that was five slides. Is my talk over? It is not because you're here tonight and I believe we should talk about the details and give you all data. Um, for those of you who aren't yet um, PNHP members, if I may be so presumptuous, um, hopefully the, the data is eventually data you'll use to talk to people um, in your community, people that you practice with um, as we talk about this. So we're going to talk about who the healthcare system serves and who it doesn't, think about how the profit-driven system, uh, system impacts not just patients and physicians, but businesses and community health talk about single payer, and hopefully give you data that resonates with you. So who is not served? As I talked about, 26.5 million uninsured, 37,000 dying every year from the lack of insurance, with medical costs leading to two thirds of personal bankruptcies, even when people had coverage. And of course, not communities, and we'll talk about the community data. So this is from the Commonwealth Fund, one of my personal favorite places to get data, but looking both at uninsured and underinsured, or people who've been insured, um, but had a coverage gap. And just looking at the definitions of underinsured, out-of-pocket costs excluding premiums equaled 10% or more of household incomes, or 5% or more for low-income um, families, that's kind of crazy numbers if you think about it. And then I dwell a little bit on this number, mostly because I'm a gynecologic oncologist. You know, every year there's about 44,000 um, people who die of breast cancer, about 35,000 who die of prostate cancer. And you just could not imagine an oncologist or a physician saying, you know, we're just not gonna worry about those deaths. Which in many ways is what we do when as a system, we simply accept the idea that there's gonna be uninsured um, and that that's reasonable to have in the health system. As we look at our, the US um, markers 
of health, our life expectancy is substantially lower than those of countries that we would consider equal to us in terms of income and resources. And interestingly, right, Costa Rica in here not thought to be in, uh, um, equal in terms of resources, but certainly doing better than we are. Infant mortality substantially higher in the United States compared to Canada, France, et cetera. Maternal mortality substantially higher with considerable differences um, by um, race um, with the most marked uh, rates, highest rates being seen in African-American um, women, but even for um, highest income white women, rates that are higher than our similar countries. And this is a really interesting, you know, piece of information, right? Looking at our mortality rate, considering, you know, comparing us to these 17 other peer nations at every age range where we are substantially under everybody until we get to, wow, age 65, what happens then? Universal health care in America happens then. Um, we hopefully will have some time to talk about some of the flaws of the Medicare system now that it is becoming privatized and the flaws of the Medicare uh, Advantage plans. Um, but even that gives us some information. And then it might be that, hey, we have this great health care, like we just need to spend money on it. Now we spend plenty of money, right? We spend a lot more than everybody, both total and in public and private spending. You know, I selected out a few slides of my 70 slides I previously mentioned, um, kind of the ones that I think matter the most, but we, um, there's so many ways in which we can look at the problems of our current care, right? So access to care increasing over time, either there's a problem and you don't see someone, you can't afford to or don't fill a prescription, you skip a recommended test, et cetera, don't, aren't able to get to a specialist either because they're not available. And a lot of times you say, oh, well, healthcare in America is so much more expensive because we just use more of it. This is not true. We do not spend more time in the hospital. We do not get more visits per capita. And the other data that I flipped, but I can't help, I took out, but I have to speak of is lots of times people will say, well, America's just less healthy than everyone. No, we don't smoke as much as they do in Europe. We are younger as a population compared to Japan and much of Europe. Um, and so that doesn't account for this. Again, this data, this number that I've cited several times already, this two thirds of bankruptcy related to medical or illness related um, work loss. And again, the you know substantial percentage of patients who had insurance at the time they got sick, 77%. So where does our money go? This $4.3 trillion we're spending, 34% roughly, we believe about $1 trillion, over a $1 trillion is in administrative spending where the largest proportion of that is insurance companies and profit. And then there's the billing systems within hospitals and offices, although that's changing as offices um, and physicians are being swallowed up into these big organizations. Just thinking about total healthcare system administrative expense, comparing us to Taiwan that does have universal coverage of all um, everyone there. Looking at the difference between traditional, that is not Medicare Advantage, but traditional Medicare overhead of 2.3% versus United Healthcare of 18.5%. This is like one of those slides that always gets my heart rate a little up, right? We're talking about physician shortages. And meanwhile, we continue to have just dramatic increase in administrators in uh, healthcare. Imagine Duke Medical System with about 960 beds, 1,600 billing clerks, spending about $100,000 in billing costs for one primary care physician compared to Canada, roughly 1,300 beds with seven, seven, like just seven, one digit billing clerks. Who else is not served? 
by our system. I touched on U.S. businesses and the potential harms done to them as well as physicians. So doctors spend twice as much time in the electronic billing record than the, as they do with patients. Pretty dramatic, pretty depressing. And then Epic Notes, this is one of my favorite little pieces of data. Average number of characters per ambulatory notes in all of these countries that are sort of our equals, so to speak. And then characters in American notes. Now, is this because we are just so verbose and we just, I don't know, took lots of English classes? No, this is because we need to include all those characters so the companies we can we work for can bill at the highest rates. Is it in mal, you know malpractice insurance that makes healthcare more expensive in America? This is Rhode Island compared to several provinces in Canada. Well, we just you know we make more money as physicians. That's what's screwing up the system, and yeah, not so much. This is uh, Canada compared to the United States in a wide range of primary care and specialty care, where essentially I would say relatively equivalent um, salaries. And then again, I think we need to spend much more of our time talking to what a drain on businesses, both large and small, the burden of providing healthcare is, which, you know, it's clearly been documented in the auto industry um, when the United States kind of fell dramatically behind internationally. Um, but even if, you know, you look at, again, this is a Commonwealth Fund survey, surveyed small business owners, asked, what's the biggest challenge facing your business? The cost of providing healthcare coverage to employees, not finding new, you know, customers, developing better widgets, whatever it might be. No cost of providing health care. So if it's not doctors, if it's not patients, if it's not businesses, if it's not, you know, our communities, who is served by our current system? Health insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, now increasingly private equity, and of course the CEOs and shareholders of those um, companies. I took out a lot of slides about the pharmaceutical industry, but I had to leave this one in because this is the other conversation I frequently get when I'm talking um, is, yeah, but, you know, we need those insurance companies and drug companies. They're doing all that great research. How much do they spend on research and development? 13 percent um, versus marketing and admin and profits. But we know that admin includes salaries. So that's kind of part of profits. So our money goes to these companies and their profits and to their CEOs in compensation. These are smaller, smaller healthcare companies. Um, again, with just these millions and millions in uh, annual compensation. And then the profits of the nonprofit systems, you know, whether they're university systems or um, systems like Kaiser. All right, this is kind of a weird slide. I give a lot of talks to patients. I give a lot of talks to integrative oncology group. And usually it's like around here when I'm looking at the salaries of CEOs, my blood pressure's up and my heart rate's up. So everyone's going to take, do a little quick breathing exercise. We're going to breathe in through your mouth for a count of four. You're going to hold for seven. We're going to breathe out for eight. That's one breath. I want everybody to do four breaths. I'm only doing one with you because I'm going to keep talking. But we're going to do it now. We're going to breathe in through our mouths for a count of two, three, four. I can see you guys. You're not breathing. I'm going to start over. We're going to breathe in through our mouths for a count of two, three, four. You're going to hold two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then you're going to breathe out two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You guys are gonna keep doing the breathing exercise. But I almost put this in as a joke to myself. 
you know, those other talks that I'm giving to patients or I'm giving when I'm talking about integrative oncology, where like that sort of parasympathetic tone change that we do for ourselves when we take those breaths, they do decrease our blood pressure, they do decrease our heart rate, and they have the potential to help health, but they do not have the potential to solve the problems either for the United States or for us as individuals, right? So when we think about solutions for the US, we're gonna talk about single payer and the different terms we use. And then for us as individuals, right? You know, the majority of the people on this call, you're already here, you're already spending your evening, you're asking questions, you're getting data, you're joining this community. Many of you all already belong to PNHP, but I'd encourage those of you that don't to consider it as a way to use your voice. I'd encourage you to vote, to give talks, to talk in small and large groups, and to meet your legislators. So we previously looked at this slide thinking about why single payer or improved Medicare for all provides a solution. Um, there's a lot of very experienced single payer advocates on our call on this uh, group tonight, um, but I'll just remind us all that we've had a real evolution of the language and we're gonna have to continue to evolve our language as Medicare has been chipped away by the Medicare Advantage Plan. So again, all medically necessary care, no co-pays, deductibles, or premiums, no need for supplemental insurance with nobody left out, including, you know, no restrictions on age, employment, or immigration status. Everyone's covered for your entire life, no pre-existing conditions, and free choice of doctors and hospitals. So thinking differently about healthcare funding, hospital funding, where we use global budgets, a place again to save um, administrative waste, and thinking about the idea, right, that you know, mental health, addiction, labor and delivery, not profitable. And so, so many parts of our country, especially in rural areas, not having access to this care. Predictable, stable funding, even during crises like COVID, where again, we had such gaping holes in our ability to provide care. So again, comparing that commercial insurance with narrow networks, unaffordable premiums, the need for prior authorizations, and then ongoing changes with Medicare for all. Free choice again, all care covered, all medically necessary coverage, no interruptions in care. Can we afford it? Um, from all of the data, we know that 95% of households would pay less than they currently pay in premiums, co-pays, and prescriptions. Is it feasible? If we think about the savings and where that savings comes from, the administrative cost, you know, drug device negotiations, that savings, what we're planning on spending more money on, the rest of the people who are uncovered, that 9 to 11%, um, we would still save money. And then I think the other challenge is, is depending on how we ask this question, right? Most people support the idea of Medicare for all, and then we start couching it in terms that are red and blue and socialism and labels, um, and we find ourselves in a different place. And again, the idea that over time, um, even among physicians, we're seeing increases. So in that now the most recent data I have, 2017, shows more physicians supporting care, supporting Medicare for all. So, you know, just a final like plea for this concept of, it really, really is hard to be a practicing clinician. Um, you know, many of you guys on, on the um, webinar tonight have heard my personal story and challenges of providing specialty oncology care. And ultimately it's working um, with PNHP. You know, I was actually at Northwestern, that was a long time ago, really struggling. And somewhere along the way, I got a um, email about some kind of presentation that was being made down, you know, in Springfield on a possible single payer option. And 
kind of had some knowledge about it. I, of course, had my PhD in uh, cost analysis and public health at the time. And I was like, hmm, I don't know what's going on in sh Chicago. I'll just go down to Springfield and see what's going on at this uh, hearing. And at the hearing, I can't remember, I add some, I kind of made some sort of comment. And um, I was approached by Nick Scala. And he was like, wait, are you a physician from Chicago? I got a group for you. And, um, you know, that was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. 